Greetings, gentlemen. This is going to be both old school and new school MGTOW content, which is to say that I'm going to be combining older concepts with newer concepts, and with luck and thought, I hope to weave them all into something new, at least conceptually. So I'm going to be covering uh, quite a bit of ground here, talking about red pill rage, male motivation, and uh, interaction between men and women. Now, Let's start with red pill rage, because red pill rage is a, a misunderstood phenomenon, I think, by many. Even the men who are suffering from it, as it were, don't understand it. And, and to the outsider, certainly to the blue pillar, it makes no sense. And I think most people uh, who are MGTOW have been through some phase of red pill rage, perhaps not all people. I mean, certainly Barbarossa was at some point in time in that stage, and I had uh, briefly partaken of it. But people don't really understand what it is, and it's intimately tied to a number of other concepts I'll be talking about. So red pill rage, which seems to be this manifestation, which I refer to me of as the storm. It's the storm. It's the, the anger. You got a sense of betrayal. Now, before I go more into red pill rage, I need to talk about something I said a long time ago. Many of my oldest subscribers will remember when I made the following statement. You can either love women, or you can understand them, but you can't do both. Now, you might remember why I said that, but it's important to reiterate here. You can either love women, or you can understand them, you can't do both. Well, when we talk about loving women, and I'm not going to try to define love, because everyone knows what I mean in that sort of generic sense, the love the blue pill man bears for the human female is very much a mystic construct, a concept. It's, it has no understanding to it. It's merely the appreciation of a fantasy. And I'll be talking more about fantasy as the video proceeds, but that's what it is. It's, a, it's attachment, a sense of compulsion, a sense of, well, obsession, in fact, uh, with the mystical, with the misunderstood. Love is a miasmic feeling. It doesn't really explain itself. And it, uh, as long as you're in that miasma, it doesn't allow itself to be explained. And blue pill men regularly experience what uh, they refer to as love for women. And the red pill rage man, the man who is actually just a slight step to the right of the blue pill man, I'm going to argue here that he still loves women. That is to say, he's still intrigued by fascinated by and obsessed by this mystic construct, uh, this miasma that uh, people, men, conventionally refer to as love. But what do I mean by that? There's a sense of betrayal, yes, but what is the sense of betrayal? The sense of betrayal that the red pill rage man feels is that something is wrong with his mystic construct. It's not as mystical and fabulous and beautiful and perfect as he thought it was. It's something different, something very different. But he still doesn't know what it is. But he knows that it's not correct. And so he is slightly to the right of the blue pill man in that he senses that there's something wrong about the miasma of love that he has sunk into and has experienced. He knows that at its base there's something not terribly fulfilling about it. Now, this can be quite painful. It's all the more painful because it, the red pill rage is not begotten of, of understanding. It, it, it's, it's merely a slight shift to the right of the mystical appreciation of love for women, male love for women. All these things desire to protect, to provide, to, to well, effectively allow oneself to be ensorcelled and turn women into a magical object. In some cases, this might be referred to as pedalizing uh, women, but uh, it's a lot more. It, it, it goes down deeper. Male mother need. There are all these elements that are woven into it. Male mother need, uh, pedalizing women, obsessing, letting one be overrun by emotions because it feels good. Now, red pill rage is a response to the perception that this formerly perfect vision 
picture, if you will, has cracks in it. There are minute cracks that are being detected, but it's not understood, the picture. It's not, the cracks are not understood for what they are. They're just imperfections. They're malignancies. They're things that destroy his sense of peace in the context of a fantasy of this miasma of love. Now, and it's very natural to feel anger at that, because if you think something is perfect and beautiful and without flaw, and you start detecting flaws, and you start sensing that there's some imperfection there, that the miasma that you never perceived as a miasma actually is somewhat fetid and swamp-like, and that there's a smell issue to it that you don't really appreciate, that could, that could piss you off, that could make you angry, of course. And many men feel a great deal of anger at this. But it is, of course, not apprehension, it's just that slight shift, that, that, that the beginning of noticing certain cracks in a formerly impeccable picture or painting. The question, though, in this context, and let's remember why women are not lovable. This is important, too, because I'll be talking about understanding versus loving. Loving women is tantamount to, like I said, subjecting yourself to almost a religious feeling. It is, and I'm talking a lot more about suspension of disbelief, it is a kind of permanent physiological suspension of disbelief in the male that can only be conditioned out of the male through rigorous application of the male mind, through analysis and study. And I have a lot more to say about that, but if you understand women, you're not going to love them. And why is that? Because women are host to many unlovable qualities. They're disloyal, they're fickle, they're mercurial, they're self-centered, they're vain. They have no honor. Not at least in the sense that men have honor. And even though one might heap them with praises as being you know, great mothers and caretakers of children, which of course is not a consistent fact, uh, all of that good stuff never applies to the male or her partner, right? Which is, you know, the male is a utilitarian asset. So the qualities that women bring to bear with regards to their, uh, their men, as it were, are <laughs> not lovable qualities. They're some of the most negative qualities a human being can have, as the aforementioned ones I've mentioned. Now, that comes about through understanding, but... Red pill rage is not that understanding. Now, to perceive and apprehend that and fully understand that, you're not going to love women anymore. Most of us, including myself, I don't love women. It's not possible anymore to love women. I don't love those qualities in human beings. They're not lovable qualities. They're not qualities I appreciate. Who appreciates dishonor, disloyalty, uh, fickleness, uh, self-centeredness, uh, mercantilism, etc.? These are not qualities that, you know, in interpersonal relationships, whether with men or women, that generally speaking, we uh, seek to elevate in our lives and to appreciate. And so you know, all there is is understand, understanding where that comes from. Now, these are not malicious qualities, though, in the sense that they're not maliciously uh, driven. They're driven by reproductive needs. What is the physiological, biological purpose of both men and women to pass on their genes, reproductive strategies. It's all about that. And so I'm not angry at a mother bear necessarily for burying her teeth to protect her cubs and lunging at me and well, mauling me to death. But I better take note. I better be aware of a pit bull uh, growling at me with uh, massively powerful jaws. You know, these are instincts and drives, and the qualities that I've enumerated regarding women just now, they're part of their instincts and drives. They're not conscious aspects of them, for the most part, I think. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Sometimes there's a rare glimpse of self-awareness. I think we've caught women in those moments every now and then. But by and large, that's not a, a conscious thing. But you, you take note of it. You, know, you don't confront a mother grizzly with two cubs. You don't walk into a yard with a, a chained and massively muscled pit bull uh, growling and baring its teeth at you. Or you know, walk into a, 
a bank where you can see an armed robbery is taking place. Unless you're insane. No, you take note of it. And by and large, you move on. Now, Red Pill Rage, of course, is not moving on. It is something very different. Because Red Pill Rage is just that first perception of the fissures and cracks in the painting. Now, there is a danger, and I'll be talking a lot more about this, uh, to the understanding side of things. And that's the void. What is the void? Many of you have written to me over the years, possibly hundreds of you, certainly dozens, about the stages you've gone through, from blue pill, to purple pill, to red pill rage, to a state which you couldn't really describe. Well, gentlemen, let me describe it for you, because I know it all too well. The void. What is the void? Hmm. The void, which is not the storm, it's the polar opposite, is that state which you feel, but don't feel. Effectively, you feel nothing. You're numb to the world. Now, it's why you don't feel love. It's one of the reasons. But it's also why many of you have written to me, and I've felt this many times, you don't feel motivated. You see, male motivation, unless you tell yourself a narrative, and I'll have a lot more to say about narratives in a separate video regarding them, as well as nihilism, but the basic motivation for the male is, is reproductive. It's intimately tied to that. However, as you apprehend, as you begin to comprehend, understand things, human beings, men and women, our interaction with each other, with each other, intersexual relations effectively, it's very possible that the void might swallow you. And the only thing that can save you from that, in my observation, is some kind of narrative. Now, myself, I'm terrible at lying to myself. And I think I always had that potential to fall into the void. But what do I mean by that? Well. Sometimes I'll talk to my closest friend and I will tell him, and he's probably the only person in the world that actually understands me and my perception, that I feel absolutely nothing. People find that hard to believe because most people feel something, but I don't feel really anything. And part of that is training, part of that is a consequence of my environment, and part of that is just my nature. I'll give you an analogy. So. A video game can be, and we need to talk more about this later, a video game can be enjoyed for what it is. You don't need to look at the pixels and break it down. You don't need to think about the the game engine or the sound engine or the way the dialogue, dialogue is woven into it and how well the lips move and all that. But imagine a world in which everything you look at and everything you perceive is merely a mechanical function. There's no appreciation, really. There's just understanding and thus the world around you is a bunch of pixels. To the people around you, it is the video game. It is the fullness of that game. It is life. But life to me, and to some others, uh, but I think I have not met many of my oak, and it's more a curse than anything else, is simply a bunch of pixels on the screen. People's interactions, people's psychologies, etc. The void that emerges from pure understanding is powerful and threatening. So let's go back to Red Pill Rage. Well, Red Pill Rage, I believe, is an unconscious attempt to prevent oneself from falling into that void because the void begets nothing. It saps you of your motivation. You feel nothing, even if you understand virtually everything, at least as it pertains to human beings and their interactions. You don't feel motivated to do anything, unless you have some delusion or narrative. Much more on that later in a separate video. But fact of the matter is that between these two extremes, you have red pill rage slightly to the right of the blue pill fantasy. The extreme of the blue pill fantasy, of course, is total lack of understanding. It is swimming in that ambrosia, as it were. It's more a... Uh, delightfully scented ocean rather than a fetid swamp. And there's no understanding. It's purely emotive. It's feelings. That's all it is. The polar opposite of that is the void. Not a single feeling enters the picture. 
there aren't even cracks or fissures in the picture. What you see instead are the single drops that went into the paint, how things were mixed, the frame, everything. It's not really a painting any, anymore. It's just a, a composition of different things that to most other people, well, they call it a painting. When somebody describes their relationship to me, their love, to me, it's just another construct, something that I can easily deconstruct down to the pixels, down to those tiny little frames. I feel nothing doing it, even though the people who describe it to me are lost in their feelings. That is my curse, and perhaps my blessing. I've come a long way. I wasn't always quite like this, but the potential is always there. And withdrawing so much from society as I have, and generally speaking, not dealing with women, allows you to develop a very powerful sense of understanding, and consequently, a stronger sense of that void, which is to say a, a motivation to do virtually nothing. Red Pill Rage, slightly being to the right of that fantasy, is, uh, I think, a subconscious attempt to thwart that. Once you start seeing the fissures and cracks, <laughs> you get angry. And anger is an extension, a continuation of this love, this mystical love, because anger is not understanding, but it's still a feeling, right? There are things in between the void and the storm, no doubt, but it is still a feeling. And people cling to their feelings because, well, people are human. Feelings, as one might be wont to say, are uh, endemic to humans. It's what makes us human, right? And so people cling to that and they, they want to feel something. And anger and rage is better to feel, well, nothing, isn't it? Much better than feeling nothing. Because nothing can be pretty dangerous. There are a lot of MGTOW videos about harnessing pain and frustration and anger. Very few video MGTOW videos to none, I believe, that talk about the void, the nothingness, the emptiness that results in a complete understanding of the human picture, of the human sexual dynamic, the intersexual dynamic. Because it's terrifying to talk about, but here I am talking about it. It's terrifying because it's very difficult to, to appreciate unless you've felt nothing. Nothing, feeling nothing is not a depression. There's no feeling of sadness. It's just, well, how do you describe nothing? And so there is that risk and many men are terrified of falling into that once you begin to understand. And most men never will. Between these extreme polarities, say I am on the far, far right, the, the one who understands and yet looks at everything as pixels and feels nothing, and the blue pillar who, who uh, really is just living in a fantasy world, and we'll talk more about fantasy and reality in the context of the female soon, but there, there's a fear there, and I understand that. If you let go of the red pill rage, Quite possibly, you can end up in the void. Not every man does, and usually it's because they cook up all sorts of narratives. Um, you know, you can you can create a narrative about anything. I, I want to briefly talk about this in more extensively in a separate video. I mean, you can talk about going to the gym as a sort of mystical process, some struggle against yourself, which is just a delusional narrative you tell yourself, but it motivates you. Some of you, to me, going to the gym is just unpleasant experience, pain. Just something I want to get out of the way. Mechanical resistance, resistance training has its benefits. But that's because I just see everything in pixels. But if you can tell yourself a narrative, you can save yourself from falling into the void completely. Some men are completely immune to the void. I suspect just because they have very high SMV. I never, I'm, I'm honest, I've never had terribly, terribly high SMV. But regardless, that clinging, that cleaving to red pill rage, in my perception, to my mind, is that innate fear of fully accepting and understanding women, which leaves you with very little, because once you understand women, you are not gonna love them. You're gonna barely appreciate them at all. You might still yearn for the feelings they provide you, but in that context, once you understand it, that's a cauldron of many noxious and dangerous chemicals, and you are aware of the danger. A blue pillar just jumps in the cauldron. He enjoys the witch's pot, as it were. He doesn't realize he's being scalded or burnt. 
or even incinerated in some cases. The man of understanding, being a man, being an ape, which we all are, including myself, still might occasionally yearn for these things, but he recognizes that it is in fact a witch's pot, a cauldron of dangerous, venomous, noxious chemicals that, that are acidic, that are deadly, and potentially life-threatening. And so, what do you do? You yearn for the poison, and yet, in some cases, you're too wise or too understanding to partake of it. Well, I do think there are ways around this. Now let's talk about something that is very common, I'm sure all of you understand it, suspension of disbelief. What is suspension of disbelief? Well, many of you engage in it all the time. It is willingly sacrificing your faculties of reason, reason, realism, logic, just to enjoy something. A film, enjoying a film might be a very simple exercise in this. You walk into a film, the film lasts about two hours and you just enjoy it. You're not thinking, oh, this isn't realistic. Is, this isn't good. I can't really do that myself um, because, you know, pixelated vision. But more on that in a bit, you do that all the time. Suspension of disbelief. Now, when you live in reality, to enjoy things that are fantastical, fictive, you have to uh, apply this suspension of disbelief to enjoy it. Because if you don't, you're not going to enjoy it. And I think suspension of disbelief, it's, it's an almost involuntary action or instinct or impulse. People can just do it. They could do it in video games, they can do it in films. And in olden days, they could do it with books. People just do it because it's something that we've evolved to do. We do it with religion and other things and other delusions. Now, I'm going to argue, as I have, that love, the kind of love a blue pill man feels, is, is it's just a, a mystic miasma. There's no, there's no real content to it besides the feelings, the feelings one receives. But the blue pill man who partakes of the cauldron, slowly uh, boiling and getting scalded, well, he, he feels like he's enjoying it, but it's a fantasy. It's not part of reality. Now, a woman's reality is whatever her subjective feelings dictate to her at any given time. Whatever she feels, it's all about feelings. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding as it relates to women's feelings, right? I mean, they're, they're more emotional, but what does that even mean, though? It's not that women feel deeper. They don't. No woman in the world feels the depths of emotion a man can, as evidenced by the great works of art and literature and poetry, the striving that we read about in someone such as Achilles. So it's not about that, it's not about depth, it's more about, well, fickleness and mercurial, mercurial emotion. That's what it's about, right? And so a woman's reality is her subjective feeling at any given day, which can, as many of you know, change on the flip of a dime. A dime flips and next week it's different. The problem, however, is that the blue-pilled man is tethered to this fantasy, which is the reality of the woman. The reality of the woman is ever-shifting. It's just based on her immediate feelings. There's no sense of reality there. And I should add, furthermore, that the reason why women have never built civilization is because they could never escape their own fantasy, which they believe to be their reality. Men, we evolved to understand reality as it is because that's the only way you can build things and create things, to work with reality. However, that weakness that men have, that innate weakness that men have for women, well, they become tethered to that emotion, and they get lost in it. And the reality of the woman, that is her subjective feelings, becomes the reality of the man for whatever duration that reality is present. So it might last a year in the case of a relationship. It might last for three days, a week, maybe three years. And eventually the woman's, the woman's reality changes because her subjective feelings have changed. But the man, not being a woman cannot transition from the different fantasy worlds because as men, men are tethered to reality. And even in accepting the mystical construct of love, man, men, become tethered to that reality and try to understand it in that context, but they're not prepared for a shift. The man who seeks to build a building in reality, construct a tent, build a fire, he's not prepared for, say, some incredibly changeable state 
of being, such as, you know, instead of uh, rubbing flints together, you now need to, I don't know, pour ice to create fire. This, but this is probably not the best analogy, but it shows how changeable the fickle nature of woman is. And so the man becomes lost and he starts feeling pain and betrayal and all of these things that many men are familiar with when they're blue pill and blue pill men are routinely familiar with and they bemoan it and meanwhile of course the, the woman has moved on to her new fantasy i.e. reality because her new sub subjective feelings have dictated some new reality to her it usually involves another man or something else or something wrong that the man did and the man is clinging to that fantasy of a previous state of subjective feelings that the woman experienced and told him. And of course, yes, every time a woman tells you something, she means it, she does. When a woman tells you she cares about you more than anything else in the world, that she loves you, that she adores you, of course she means it in that moment. But that doesn't mean that it's gonna be around the next day or the next week or the next month and very unlikely the next year. So there's no extension or continuation of what she says. There's no, well, honor in the words it's all based on a subjective picture that is ever-shifting. But men being grounded in reality, because men have to be, they cannot be elsewise because they wouldn't be men, they wouldn't be able to build civilization and create and understand. They get lost in that fantasy, you know, four months ago. Four months ago, my girl told me that she loved me and cared about me more than anything else, that she needed me. And she meant it, and she felt that four months ago. Just now, John is a better prospect. And John is taller, more handsome, and has more money. And, and so she feels she needs him, and et cetera, et cetera. But you're, you're lost in her words as a blue pill man. It is a fantasy. Now, I'm going to argue now that if you want to deal with women in a, in a sense and still feel something, um, because... I'd argue you don't want to end up like me. I am kind of a lost cause. Everything is pixels to me. I have on occasion, believe it or not, dealt with women in my post-red pill years in a context other than, you know, giving orders to a waitress. And to me, it's just a collection of reproductive strategies. Everything they say, everything they do, I analyze in the moment and afterwards. I feel nothing, usually. Um, sometimes I feel a tinge of something, but, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quickly battered down by the my inability to engage in suspension of disbelief. Now, I'd argue that the Blue Pill Man is in a permanent state of suspension of disbelief, that state when you go to a film or enjoy a video game. Now, there's also a danger in that, too. I mean, people can play video games for you know 18 hours, 20 hours. They can cease eating and cease drinking, defecating, etc., all these things, and they can ruin their health in the process, even die in some cases. It's been noted, at least in South Korea. Um, when you engage in too much suspension of disbelief, as per the miasmic uh, romantic love, then you can endanger your very life, as is evidenced by the numerous suicides born of quote-unquote love that men commit on a fairly routine basis, but yet we see so rarely in the case of women. Women have the advantage of perceiving reality as their own subjective feelings. It's not an actual reflection of how things are, but the way they feel. There is a difference. And it's difficult. There is no doubt that it is difficult. But to walk that tightrope, to enjoy women's company, and I know a lot of men want to. Ideally, I would want to as well. It's just my curse is to see everything in pixels. It's why I feel nothing. On the other hand, it's helped me to help other men get through difficult issues, prevent them from doing things that might have harmed themselves, and, and so on and so forth, but is to apply a temporary suspension of disbelief, more akin to that two-hour film, which is to say, you enter the cinema, it's a wonderful picture, the acting is phenomenal, the special effects might be good, and you're lost in it and you appreciate it, and then a few days later, when you're thinking about it, you start thinking about those pixels. And you break it down. Now, of course, in the process, you run the risk of appreciating the film next time you choose to watch it. And there's always that risk with women. But just as you engage in a role-playing fantasy game, or any other video game, or read a book that's really engrossing, or visit the cinema, 
Women are effectively just that cinema. They're just another aspect of fantasy. Romance, feelings of attachment, feelings of closeness, bonding. It's all part of that fantasy. Of course, you want to experience that. That's part of your physiology. Even I want to experience it. I simply can't. But if, you want, if you're not as far gone as I am, and not a complete blue pillar, and exist somewhere in the middle of that bell curve of complete blue pill dolt and completely vacuous, void, and empty robot such as myself, well, there is room for experimentation. You can visit the cinema, enjoy it, leave, ruminate and reflect, and reject it in its fantastical form and accept it for what it is. Ah, these are the programs that were applied to create the special effects. That's what the actor did. This is a technique that they employed, etc., etc. Plot. You start analyzing the plot in the same way you analyze her behavior and the way she interacts with you. You know that every tender word she tells you is part of that fantasy, and it feels damn good. I know. I remember. It feels amazing. That's what men seek. They want to hear those words of comfort. They want to hear the utterances that offer them assurance and peace of mind. You know, love, as they call it. But the man in the middle can apply suspension of disbelief and appreciate it for what it is. You can be completely engrossed in a game like The Witcher 3, and then you leave it and you leave it behind. It's no longer part of your reality. I think, ultimately, and this is probably the only way to enjoy women in a sane and rational manner that is coherent and consistent with our physiology and psychology. Some of us possibly never will again, such as myself. Because to me, women are just, well, creatures with certain reproductive strategies that, uh, that they engage in. And the pixels are always there in front of me. They're never not there. It's very difficult to you know, feel that. I, I, my suspension of disbelief is uh, kind of gone as pertains to human beings. Now, for most men, that's not the case. And so, navigating fantasy versus reality is an important thing, an important aspect of enjoying female company if you so choose to do so. Sometimes you will be hit by that understanding in the middle of something. And it can be jarring. It's like, uh, it's like being at the cinema and all of a sudden there's a tear in the screen for five minutes. You're wondering what the hell goes on and then the, screen, then the, the film rolls on and you're just thinking, that was kind of weird. That will happen. Or it'll happen all the time in my case. But nonetheless, there is value in that. And the reason why there's value in that is because in order to motivate yourself to do things that you feel are important... I believe, ultimately, unless you're suffering from some delusion or you've convinced yourself of a narrative, which many men do, many people do in general, but specifically men in this context, you're, the best basis for your motivation to do things, to acquire wealth, to accomplish things, to go to the gym. And why do people go to the gym? It's for vanity's sake, to increase the perception of their, their genetic fitness. It's not because they think that resistance training will, will limit their atrophy or you know, prevent injuries or increase their, their lower back strength so that you know, when they're sitting in their chair in their office, they don't feel pain. They do it for vanity's sake. And thus, if you want to keep motivated and you can't tell yourself a narrative, if you're bad at lying to yourself, then tapping into that basic, base, instinctual reproductive desire is a useful thing. Applying suspension of disbelief in the context of females can be a useful thing because it'll help you maintain your health. It'll motivate you to work out. It'll motivate you to get things done, to stay clean and proper, and all of these things. Because I ultimately believe that unless you have that narrative, which might be separate from reproductive desire and is often commingled and intertwined, to be honest, there's no way you're going to get anything done. I know from personal experience, as someone who exists almost entirely in the void, there's no sense of motivation. There's no source of motivation. You see, pain... Anger, these are easy to work with. They're still feelings. Anger and pain can push you. If you've lost everything and you don't feel nothingness and you rather you feel something and that something is pain, that can push you. You can do all kinds of things. I know from personal experience in the days of yore and youth, but the problem many fully red-pilled men face 
is a lack of motivation. Um, and for some men, it's not that much of an issue because they naturally exist on a continuum between the void and, and storm, as it were. And for those men, it's not an issue. I'd argue that Barbarossa, for example, who has a long-term girlfriend, exists somewhere in that continuum. But it doesn't affect him to the point where it, you know, he, he's still very reproductively motivated, obviously, in a relationship, just as an example. But many of us don't do that, or we're in a different situation, different, uh, different position with our thoughts and, and how we perceive the world, and just, just naturally so. You know, just like some men are tall, some men are short, fat, skinny, etc. Some men are just on a different pole on this continuum. And so what do you do? I would argue that partaking of that fantasy and applying that suspension of disbelief can be useful uh, and perhaps the only solution to a complete lack of motivation to do anything, which I've experienced. And I know many of you have too. And by that I mean not even motivated to play video games, yes. Not even motivated to do anything but stare at the ceiling. I've been there, and many of you have too. Where does that come from? It comes from the deflation of your reproductive desires because you've understood women fully. You lack the ability, for whatever reason, to tell yourself a narrative, to convince yourself of a lie that will motivate you, like, you know, your epic battle against the iron in the gym, some nonsense like that. You just can't do it. Well, when that fails, you might just want to partake a little bit of the female in the context of suspension of disbelief, as you would a film, and then return back to reality. And, of course, the motivation will ebb and flow, and it will attenuate in time, of course, which is why you then return back to that fantasy just for a brief while to keep your motor running. It's a means to an end. And at the same time, you can enjoy the fantasy for what it is. But you're not a blue pillar, and you're not going to cling to that fantasy like some inane child. You're not going to cling to that and allow yourself to be scalded and burnt in a cauldron of noxious poison. Instead, you're going to take sips. You might have a glass of whiskey or two, but if you drink the entire bottle, well, you might have alcohol poisoning. That's what blue pill men do. They drink the entire bottle. They don't know limits. They want to be overwhelmed by the feeling. And oftentimes they are, and it feels really, really good. Until the woman's subjective feelings create a new reality for herself, but the man is left in the old reality. He's no longer part of the fantasy that is the woman's reality. And so, after many years and thought, and my own struggles and reflections concerning this, I found it most useful to occasionally, to the extent that I can, because I find it exceptionally difficult to not see the world in pixels, partake a little bit in that female fantasy just to get the motivational juices running. Because I can't lie to myself about narratives. I, I'm not religious. I can't tell myself about some epic struggle. I can't tell myself about you know mastering myself or any of the other nonsense that people will tell themselves, which is useful. Uh, a lot more to say about narratives in the future, but can't do that. So the only thing that does motivate me on occasion is tapping into that basic reproductive desire uh, associated with females, because I unfortunately am wedded to my physiology, as robotic as I am in many ways, much like other men. And, as I said, that is essentially, going back to Red Pill Rage, what that is. It is the desire to cling to something that's still empowers you, gives you a feeling of, of potency, of, of power, influence. You feel energetic. You feel alive when you're raging and angry. When you're in pain, you feel alive. When you're in love, you feel alive. When you feel the void, well, that is nothing, so you're feeling nothing. And it's wor a worse feeling than the pain because the pain hurts, but it motivates you. It can make you rise from the ashes, as it were, as the phoenix. And I know all about phoenixes, those of you who have seen my back. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that's kind of a combination of the new and the old. Reflections I've had over the years, experiences I've had, of navigating life in a post-red pill world, 
and in my case, the extreme polarity of, of void. If, blue, if the blue pill world is the storm, ever-changing, incomprehensible, then my world is the void. And I hope for your sake that you exist neither in the storm entirely nor in the void, but somewhere along that continuum, because it's going to be better for you. You know, it's going to be better for you in the long run. You're going to be more productive, whatever that means. You're going to get things done. But for me, yeah, it's just pixels. Still, it does help to occasionally interact with the female to uh, get that motivation going. So suspension of disbelief, gentlemen. That is what it is about. If you can do it, I would suggest that you do it. Because... Yeah, if you don't have the narrative or some nascent reproductive desire driving you, pushing you along anyway, that's, uh, that's what can happen. You can end up nowhere, quite literally nowhere, in your thoughts and feelings and, as a consequence, the world. And you will atrophy, and you will wither away as a human being. Well, you won't kill yourself because you feel nothing. You, people kill themselves because they feel too much pain. That's the man... The man who kills himself is a product of the, of the betrayal of the fantasy. He, the woman's moved on to her new reality. He's stuck in her old one. The void doesn't beget suicide. It's just nothing. You just wither away. So, don't follow me into the void. Don't follow the blue pillar into his world either. Find the golden mean, perhaps. Find some place on that continuum. And I think you will be a better and more content individual as a consequence. So thank you for tuning in. And I will have more to say on narratives and motivation in the future. But uh, until then, you take care and bye-bye. And as always, may the gods watch over you. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.